Okay, let's look at some foundational cases. Um, we're going to start with the Furman case and we'll go up to the Stanford v. Kentucky case. So Furman v. Georgia happens in 1972. And as we know that this um, results in a halting of executions. Furman's court-appointed attorney was given a total of $150 to represent Furman at trial. There's no guidelines to follow. The jury finds him guilty of murder and sentences him to death. And it takes them one and a half hours to reach their verdict. So they appeal to the Supreme Court and SCOTUS issues a writ of certiorari, which is basically an order to bring that case up to the Supreme Court to be heard. It includes two related cases, Jackson v. Georgia and Branch v. Texas. Both were African-American defendants convicted of capital rape. And the Supreme Court hold, holds at the time that as administered at the time, the death penalty is unconstitutional. And they issue what's called a per curiam decision. This is an unsigned opinion. And it represents a decision by the court as an institution. And they use this type of decision when they're deeply divided and wish to protect themselves from public scrutiny. Then each of the nine justices issued their own separate opinions discussing their particular views of the law. So let's start with the Furman concurring opinions. Now the problem here lay with the unbounded discretion by juries to make decisions about who should get the death penalty, right? And they're using only what information they have before them, which is the details of the crime. So all they know about Furman is his age, where he works, and that he's black. Now, Justice Douglas, in his concurring opinion, says that the death penalty is discriminatory towards disadvantaged classes of people, and Justice Marshall said it fails to deter others. Now, in a future chapter, we'll get into this in a little bit more in depth, but Marshall has what's called the Marshall Hypothesis, and he says the more knowledgeable people become on the issue of capital punishment, the less likely they will be to support it. Now, dissenting opinions, there were four dissenters, okay? They're all the most recent appointees, and they were all appointed by Nixon. And Nixon's presidential campaign focused on getting tough and limiting the rights of criminals. Furman resulted in reversal of over 600 death sentences in 39 states. Now, one option would be to attach mandatory death penalty sentences to certain crimes, and that would prevent the randomness that was occurring. But we know that in a future case, we're going to see that a mandatory death sentence is considered unconstitutional. The other is to set standards for juries and judges to help guide the decision-making process when deciding to um, deciding in favor of the death penalty. Now, Greg v. Georgia occurs in 1976, and this is where the death penalty is reinstated. Georgia has adopted at this point what's called a bifurcated process, and this is the process that is currently used by all states and the federal government. There's two phases here. One is a guilt phase where we determine if the offender is guilty of the crime. And then one is a penalty phase where we determine, again, beyond reasonable doubt, whether or not the person will receive the death penalty. Judges and juries must consider both aggravating and mitigating factors when determining if a death sentence is appropriate. Now, just as a side note, Greg escaped from prison and was killed in a bar fight the following evening. So seven justices affirmed Greg's sentence in three concurring opinions, okay? So they declared that the death penalty for murder is constitutional in some cases because retribution and deterrence are valid punishment justifications. They liked the use of the bifurcated system, and they remarked on the individual consideration each case is given under Georgia's new system, but there's a careful review of the specific circumstances in each case and the defendant's character. This leaves us with two dissenting opinions. Those are from Marshall and Brennan, and they are believers that the death penalty in and of itself is unconstitutional, so they're always going to vote accordingly. Now, in Woodson v. North Carolina in 1976, the Supreme Court also holds that mandatory death sentences are unconstitutional. In 1977, they decide whether or not the death penalty is constitutional for rape in Coker v. Georgia. At the time, Georgia was the only state that authorized the death penalty for adult rape. So in a 7-2 vote, the court held that it's grossly disproportionate and excessive punishment. Coker is serving multiple life sentences. Now, the Coker concurring opinions, the justices noted that the Eighth Amendment should carry a fluid interpretation that changes as society grows and evolves. So they used the evolving standards of decency standard for controversial topics. 
This allows the court to consider how the framers would have acted today when determining if a certain punishment violates the Eighth Amendment. Georgia was the only state with a capital rape statute, and juries rarely imposed it. So our current standard would be that the death penalty is not appropriate for rape. Now, in terms of the dissenting opinion, the court said they should have limited its decision to the specific issue in Coker's case rather than the broader issue of whether the death penalty is constitutional for rape. And they took issue with the claim that the death penalty is not proportional for rape. Despite this ruling, some states went on to create death penalty statutes for rape of a child, which is later ruled unconstitutional in Kennedy v. Louisiana in 2008. <laughs> In 1978, the court hears a pair of cases, Lockett v. Ohio and Bell v. Ohio. Here they're looking at Ohio's capital murder state statutes. Are they too restrictive because they're not allowing individual considerations of the defendant and the crime? Now, at the heart of the Lockett case is an Ohio statute that required the imposition of the death penalty if at least one of the following mitigating circumstances were not present. That the victim induced or facilitated the offense, that the offenders would not have the offenders would not have been sorry the offense would not have been committed if not for duress coercion or strong provocation and that the criminal act was primarily the product of psychosis or mental deficiency now Lockett had a low IQ or minor criminal history and was likely to be rehabilitated he did not have psychosis or mental deficiency and the other two elements were not formally addressed the court held that the statute here violated the 8th and 14th Amendments. In the concurring opinion, they said that the 8th and 14th Amendment requires all aspects of a defendant, their criminal history, and their circumstances, wherein a defendant asserts a lesser role in the offense, needs to be considered as mitigating factors. Essentially, we have to take into account every mitigating factor. Capital cases are unique, and therefore we need to really focus on the unique characteristics of the defendant. Any attempt made by legislators to prevent a sentencing authority from weighing the mitigating factors and mandating a death sentence absent the findings of a few statutorily set mitigating factors is incompatible with the 8th and 14th Amendment. Rehnquist is the sole dissenter here, and he did not agree that the state should have to consider unbounded mitigation in capital cases. Some other cases of interest. As I mentioned, all mitigation needs to be considered. Felony murder rule is invalidated for capital cases. Um, in Lockhart, Lockhart v. McCree, uh, we get what we call death-eligible jurors. Okay, So this means um, everybody who's on a jury in a death penalty case has to agree that they could potentially impose the death penalty. If anybody says, nope, there's no way in hell I'd ever impose the death penalty, they can be struck from the jury. And they are struck from the jury. So Lockhart v. McCree basically upheld that. Payne v. Tennessee says the Eighth Amendment does not prohibit the jury from considering the impact a victim's death has had on surviving family members. Now, in 1987, in McCluskey v. Kemp, we're looking at racial discrimination in capital sentencing. And they're looking at the Balda study from 1983. They examined over 2,000 capital cases in Georgia during the 70s. And they looked at the effect of race on sentencing. And they looked at the race of victims and the race of offenders and found that, indeed, race did play a role, even when we control for important non-racial factors like aggravating circumstances. And they found that those who murdered white victims were 4.3 times more likely to get the death penalty. And black defendants with white victims have the greatest chance of receiving the death penalty. Now, the Supreme Court said the study is valid, but we're not sure it should be the basis for declaring the death penalty unconstitutional. And they upheld McCluskey's sentence. He alleged his 14th, rights were 14th Amendment rights were violated based on the Balda study. And the majority ruled that he needed to show that there was discrimination in his case. So you can't just argue discrimination exists in the system. You have to show that discrimination existed in... Oops. That it existed in your case. And they felt that his argument that there's discrimination in this is best addressed by a legislature. They were concerned that if he were to prevail, it would open the floodgates for other groups uh, to say they too suffer from discriminatory application of the death penalty. Now, again, remember that Brennan and Marshall 
are anti-death penalty. They feel it is always cruel and unusual. Um, they felt that the Baldus study did indicate a greater likelihood of black defendants receiving a death sentence and therefore general devaluing of their lives. In Turner v. Murray, they said cases involving interracial crime, in cases involving interracial crime, they can inform potential jurors of the victim's race and question them about racial prejudice in an effort to obtain an unbiased jury. So that has to do with voir dire. Um, in 2005, the court said it was unconstitutional for prosecutors to use their peremptory challenges to exclude jurors based on race. And in Snyder v. Louisiana, they basically upheld that prior ruling. Stanford v. Kentucky involves a pair of juvenile death penalty cases where they argue that the Eighth Amendment prohibits the death penalty for ju juveniles. They said prosecutors seldom seek it and juries seldom impose it. And the court disagreed in a 5-4 to four vote. Now in the concurring opinions, they said, let's look at the evolving standards of decencies. 15 states did not permit the death penalty for those under 16 and 12 did not permit it for those 17 and under. The majority said this is not a national consensus. Now the dissenter said, actually 27 states do not execute juveniles and that is a majority because they're incorporating all the states that don't execute anybody. The rare use of death penalty for juveniles by both prosecutors and juries show that this is an unusual punishment. Juveniles are only 1.37% of the total death row population. We also treat juveniles differently regarding other issues, right? We generally acknowledge they're not as responsible. We don't allow them to vote. We don't allow them to drink. We don't allow them to drive until they're a certain age. Now, the trial court noted that Stanford was emotionally immature and would be a good candidate for treatment. And neither retribution nor deterrence is served by executing juveniles. In Thompson v. Oklahoma, we held that it was unconstitutional to execute anyone who committed a crime at the age of 15. And finally, in 2005, um, it was ruled unconstitutional to execute juveniles, anyone who has committed a crime when they were under the age of 18. And here we just kind of have a quick summary of the, these foundational cases. Uh, what's the issue and what's the actual ruling? And that wraps up this chapter.